Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shanyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhubaye Vachapatita Nam Pavane Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We're reading the Bhagavad Gita chapter 3 text number 37 Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Kama Esha Kroda Esha Rajaguna Samut Baba Mahashano Mahapapma Vidi Inam Ehabairinam Sri Bhagavan Vacha, the personality of God had said Kama lust Esha this Kroda Rath Esha this Rajaguna the mode of passion Samud Bhava, born of Maha Ashana, all devouring, Maha Papma, greatly sinful, Vidi, no, Enam, this, Iha, in the material world, Vairinam, greatest enemy. Translation The Supreme Personality of God has said, It is lust only, Arjuna which is born of contact with the material mode of passion and later transformed into wrath and which is the all-devouring sinful enemy of this world. Purport by Srila Prabhupada When a living entity comes in contact with the material creation, his eternal love for Krishna is transformed into lust in association with the mode of passion, or, in other words, the sense of love of God becomes transformed into lust, as milk in contact with sour tamarind is transformed into yogurt. Then again, when lust is unsatisfied, it turns into wrath. Wrath is transformed into illusion. An illusion continues the material existence. Therefore, lust is the greatest enemy of the living entity, and it is lust only which induces the pure living entity to remain entangled in the material world. Wrath is the manifestation of the mode of ignorance. These modes exhibit themselves as wrath, and other corollaries. If therefore the mode of passion, instead of being de degraded into the mode of ignorance, is elevated to the mode of goodness by the prescribed method of living and acting, then one can be saved from the degradation of wrath by spiritual attachment. All right, so I'll speak on th that. There's a long purport, but I'll speak on each paragraph. Let's see how it goes. Uh, so this is the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Lord Krishna was describing Karma Yoga to Arjuna. And Arjuna had asked the Lord a question, a very a very important question. Arjuna asked Lord Krishna, by what is one impelled to sinful acts, even unwilling, as if engaged by force? And it was in reply to that question, the Lord had spoken these following wor these words, which we just read. Kama Esha, Kroda Esha, Raja Guna Samud Bhavaha, Mahashano Mahapapmam Vidi Inam Ehavairinam. Very important section here in the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. 
we have to understand the cause of our sinful activities and we have to understand the effect of our sinful actions. So Lord Krishna explains, it, lust is born of contact with the material mode of passion. This planet, of course, the earth planet, is full of the mode of passion. And most of you, most of us, will live city life, live in a city which is another place of passion. So we're surrounded by this mode of passion, or as it's described in Sanskrit, Rajagun. Rajagun, the mode of passion, and Tamagun, the mode of ignorance. So this Rajagun is the big problem. This uh, lust is transformed into, well, this lust is born of contact with the mode of passion, right? Because we are in the mode of passion. So that Prabhupada explains that actually in our pure form, we have love of God, eternal love for Krishna. It is stated in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sudya Kobunai Shravanadi Shuddha Chitti Kore Hi Udai. All right, Bengali people will know the meaning of this. The love of Krishna is eternally established in the hearts of all living entities. And it is awakened by hearing about Krishna. It's there in our heart, but the problem is it's covered over. It's covered over. And so we have to remove the coverings. We have to wake it up, revive it. Just like here in India, this time of the year now is becoming cold. And so in the winter season, people will be more inclined to sleep more. They want to remain in their bed, remain covered over with blankets. You know, you, you try to wake them up and they just pull the blankets over. Maybe you don't need winter. Maybe even in Malaysia people are like that in the morning. Try to wake people up to get them out of the mode of ignorance. It's not very easy. S sleep is the mode of ignorance. But that mode of ignorance actually came from the mode of passion. And that mode of passion was actually the transformation of our pure love for Krishna. Eternally, we have love of Krishna in our hearts. But that sense of love of God, it's, Prabhupada gives an example. He says, just like milk, when it's in touch with tamarind, you can make yogurt. We don't usually purchase yogurt. You purchase yogurt, they put all kinds of chemicals and things into it. We like to make our own yogurt. When I, I remember uh, becoming a devotee, I was learning, they taught, devotees taught me how to make yogurt. I was impressed at their knowledge. I didn't know how to make yogurt, but the devotees knew. Prabhupada had taught them in the beginning. And so you purchase some milk, and you boil the milk, bring it up to boil, and then let it cool down to the temperature of the body, to the body temperature, where you can just put your finger in the milk. And then you have to put, you put the yogurt culture in. But here Prabhupada's talking about using tamarind. You can also use tamarind, sour tamarind. So sour tamarind, when it comes in contact with the milk, then it will help, it will change the milk into yogurt. And you get a good yogurt. Without all the chemicals, you, you purchase these things. And, you know, people nowadays, Kali Yuga, we're so lazy, we don't do things ourselves. We just go and purchase everything. But actually, Krishna likes us to make our own yogurt. It's much thicker, 
much more pure and natural. So Prabhupada gives the example that our, our sense of love of God becomes transformed. Just like the milk is transformed to yogurt, our sense of love of God is transformed into lust by the association with the mode of passion. Yeah, we are associating with the mode of passion. We may not know it, but we are. We associate with the mode of passion. We live on this earth planet. The higher planet is more the mode of goodness. The lower planets are the mode of ignorance and we're in the middle. We're in the mode of passion. And then people who live in the countryside are in the mode of goodness. We're in the cities. We're in the mode of passion. If you live in the bar or the casino or something, then that's the mode of ignorance. But we're in, in the cities, we're influenced. Just like in Malaysia, what do they say about Malaysia? Kuala Lumpur, the city that never sleeps, right? Day and night, you can go around Kuala Lumpur, the restaurants are open and people are going there and eating in the middle of the night. Everything just goes on all night. And that's the mode of passion and leading to the mode of ignorance. So we have to be very conscious of that. Association with the mode of passion is a problem. And Srila Prabhupada is warning us. He said, if we're not careful, the mode of passion degrades into the mode of ignorance. In the beginning, there is lust. But when our desire, lust means desire for enjoyment, that we want something, I would, you know, I want a new car, I want, a, I want to get this, I want that. So many desires we have. They're just different types of lust. So when we don't get what we want, then the nature of the living entity is it becomes angry. And anger means the mode of ignorance. We should be very careful. Later on in the Bhagavad Gita, in chapter 17, Lord Krishna will describe that there are three gates leading to hell. Lust, anger and greed. And every sane person will be wise to avoid these three gates. Now, the, the crucial gate, the one where it come, everything comes from, is lust. From lust comes anger. You don't get what you want, you become angry. And when we get what we want, we want more. That's greed. So the three th lust, anger, and greed, they're described as three gates into hell. We should be very cautious very cautious. We don't want to go to hell. We want to avoid that. So we have to be very careful to avoid lust, anger and greed. And the anger and the greed, they're in, they're initially they're present in the form of lust. And that lust is described here in this verse. It's the all-devouring sinful enemy of this world. Oh, it's such a terrible thing. It's not a very nice thing. We should be very careful to try to get rid of this lust from the heart. How to get rid of the lust? Srila Prabhupada gives us the clue. He said, we want to, instead of, instead of being degraded to the mode of ignorance, we want to be elevated to the mode of goodness. We want to cultivate the mode of goodness. And Prabhupada explains how to do it. He said, by the prescribed method of living and acting. Then we can be saved from the degradation of wrath by spiritual attachment. We have to develop our attachment to Lord Krishna. That is spiritual attachment. We can be saved from that wrath. Now, if we find ourselves becoming angry, it's not good. We should take care to avoid these things. 
Anger is coming from the lust. The lust is not being satisfied, so therefore we become angry. We must be very conscious and careful to avoid falling into these pitfalls, lust and anger and greed. They're not becoming a devotee. Devotee means you have to come to the mode of goodness and get free from the influence of the lower modes. Not only the mode of goodness, we want to rise up to the mode of pure goodness, to transcend all influence of passion and ignorance. So this, this is done by the prescribed method of living and acting. Just like devotees who live in the Krishna conscious center, they wake up early in the morning, take a bath, full bath, put on clean cloth and then worship and then begin to chant the holy name and then do some worship of the deity and then hear Srimad Bhagavatam, maybe decorate the deity with some flowers and offer arti. Like this, we'll pass the morning in the worship of the, the Lord and engaging in devotional activities. It's a different lifestyle from what most of us are used to. You know, most people, how we live in the, the world, we sleep very late and we get up very late in the morning. So when we get up in the morning, you know, it's already daylight and you don't really feel like doing anything and you just want to have some breakfast and you didn't chant Hare Krishna, you didn't do any devotion in the morning practically. So that's not a very satisfactory method of living and acting. We have to be, be willing to make some adjustments to become Krishna conscious. Of course it's difficult for people who are in family life and it's especially difficult if your family are not devotees. How to do it? <laughs> well, we could say this is our karma, that we're in this situation, the result of our own karma. But we don't need to, uh, we, can't, we can't just simply go on like that. We have to make some efforts to bring ourselves up, out of the passion, away from the passion, and the ignorance and to come up to the mode of goodness. It takes practice. It, it's not immediately, we can do this immediately overnight. It will take some time. And just like most of you, you may have children. So the children grow up and then they go away, they get married, and they go away. They want to be on their own. They like to have their own home. Or they have their, they go off to some faraway place where they find a job or studying and they don't care to come and be with mom and dad. Hmm. So then you have an opportunity to become more Krishna conscious. Of course, not always like that. And if they stay with you anyway, you're not, it's your home. You have, a, you have the opportunity to do what you like. But it's certainly uh, encouraged for us to cultivate the mode of goodness. No, we can do it also in the, in the evening. The evening is more the mode of ignorance, the darkness. So we have to be very careful to be Krishna conscious, not only in the morning, in the evening also. So you do an evening program, you chant in the evening, just like just before I came here, we, I went to the temple and we did Damodar. We sang the Damodar prayers and we offered a lamp. Because afterwards from here I have another class, so I don't have an opportunity to go and do the lamp offering in the temple. So I had to do it earlier tonight. And so for the month of Damodar, we're making these efforts to offer lamps. It's making us more God conscious. We become more serious about our spiritual practice. 
We have to do this, right? Every day, sing the Damodar Astikam, offer a light to the Lord. So these are some things which help to keep us in the mode of goodness. When we're regularly singing the glories of the Lord, singing the Damodar prayers every day, it keeps us in God consciousness. Sometimes we're so busy we don't get any kirtan, hardly, except Mongol arti in the morning. But we should be making time. The gopis were very busy, but they were always chanting. The gopis were busy. They had children. They had to take care of the cows. They had to clean. They had to do so many things. But they were always doing kirtan. They were always chanting the glories of Krishna and singing beautiful songs about Krishna. And there are so many nice songs to sing. We just have to cultivate these songs, practice singing these songs. Just like if you go to the temple program, we sing the songs. We sing uh, Sri Guru Charana Padma. We sing that song. And, and then that's for the Prabhupada Guru Puja. And then we, sometimes when we worship the spiritual master, we will sing Gurudev Kripa Bindutiya Koro Ehitas. Like that, there are many different songs which we sing. Here in Mayapur, when they greet the Panchatattva, then they like to sing Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu. Daya Koramore. So there are so many songs, wonderful songs. We want to keep our tongue always engaged, chanting the glories of Krishna. And so many slokas. How many slokas in the Bhagavad Gita? Who knows how many slokas in the Bhagavad Gita? 700. 700. So, a lot of slokas to be learned. And how many more slokas in the Bhagavatam? So, so many nice verses are there. Many devotees during this month of Kartik, they also sing the Gopi Gita. Gopi Gita, a beautiful song in the 10th canto Srimad Bhagavatam. Chapter number 31 of the 10th canto is the Gopi Gita. And there are only 19 verses. But they're in a very beautiful meter, and it's very wonderful to sing it every day, and it helps you to remember the gopis and their love for Krishna. So these are all things which we can do, which will help to keep us away from the passion and ignorance. As well as, of course, very important things like taking only food offered to Krishna, only prasadam, and then bathing two or three times a day. These things are also very helpful for us. So, uh, I'll just read a little bit more from the purport. The Supreme Personality of Godhead expanded Himself into many for His ever-increasing spiritual bliss. And the living entities are parts and parcels of this spiritual bliss. They also have partial independence, but by misuse of their independence, when the service attitude is transformed into the propensity for sense enjoyment, they come under the sway of lust. This material creation is created by the Lord to give facility to the conditioned souls to fulfill their lustful propensities. And when completely baffled by prolonged lustful activities, the living entities begin to inquire about their real position. So Srila Prabhupada is explaining about the position of the living entity and comparing the living entity's position to the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord, of course, is his body is Satchidananda. He has a spiritual form, eternity, bliss, and knowledge. 
and the living entity is also Satchidananda. But th there's some difference that the living entity is very small in comparison to the Supreme Lord. Just like the qualities which are displayed by the Lord are very complete and full, fully manifest. But the qualities, the same qualities when displayed by the living entity are very small and minute, partial. Hmm? And so Prabhupada talks about the independence of the living entity. Just like the Supreme Lord, He is supremely independent. He, and the word is Swarat. In Srimad Bhagavatam, in the very first verse, it's mentioned about how the Lord is Swarat. He's fully independent, that He can choose where He wants to re reside who, and what He wants to do. He's completely independent. So we also have independence. Our independence is to choose Krishna or Maya. That is our independence. We give the example just like it. If you're if you're if you're taking, if you're traveling in a car, you don't have a lot of independence. Somebody else is driving the car. You're sitting in the car, <laughs> so you're not going to jump out while the car is being driven. You just stay in the car and wait till it comes to a destination. Then you can get out and do what you want. So we have our little bit of independence. But the problem is we misuse it. Our independence, by misuse of our independence, instead of taking shelter of Krishna, we take shelter of Maya. In other words, instead of thinking about doing devotional service, we think about sense enjoyment, material sense gratification, which has nothing to do with Krishna, which is just simply due to the influence of lust. So this is the way of material life. Krishna arranges to give us that facility. He doesn't force us. Now people sometimes say, why did Krishna give us that independence that we could fall into Maya? Why didn't Krishna put us with Him? Why do we have to have that independence? We have to understand that without independence, there's no meaning to love. Just like in the relationship between the man and the woman, if the, if the woman is forced to marry the man, there's no love there. The love may develop in course of time, but initially there's no love. Maybe the woman is forced by her parents that you have to marry this man, and so maybe she has to do it because the parents force her. Or maybe the man even forces her. And the man said, you love me or else. You're, and you're forced. to. The woman is forced to marry the man. So that is not love. Right? Love may develop in course of time. And how does love develop? By service. So the same way in relationship with the Lord. Krishna gives us independence. He does not force us that we have to be surrendered to Him and we have to work for Him and serve Him. He gives us a free will. What do we want to do? Which way do we want to go? So we have to choose for ourselves. Make proper use of our independence. Now, if we choose to go against Krishna, away from Krishna, Krishna, oh, okay, go ahead. Go and, and be with Maya. And, of course, being with Maya means it's not a very pleasant existence. There's a struggle. There's a lot of suffering, a lot of misery. There's envy, there's hatred. There's so many problems, just like in material life you associate with non-devotees, then you'll see all of these things. All the different qualities, bad qualities are there when you associate with the non-devotees. 
But we chose. We were given the freedom. Which way did we want to go? So living entity is actually meant to inquire about his real position. We're not meant to just think only about where am I going to enjoy? Where am I going to get sense gratification? Where will I get good food to eat? Where will I get a good sleep? Where will I be able to enjoy my senses? Right? The animal propensities, eating and sleeping, mating, defending, that is not what we want. We want to get away from that. We want the real thing, the real life, Krishna consciousness. So we have to inquire, what is actually our real duty? Going ahead to the purport, Prabhupada explains, this inquiry is the beginning of the Vedanta Sutra, wherein it is said, Atato Brahma Jignasa, one should inquire into the Supreme. And the Supreme is defined in Srimad Bhagavatam as Janma Dyasya Yato Navaya Dittaratasya, or the origin of everything is the Supreme Brahman. Therefore, the origin of lust is also in the Supreme. If therefore lust is transformed into love for the Supreme, or transformed into Krishna consciousness, or in other words, desiring everything for Krishna, then both lust and wrath can be spiritualized. Hanuman, the great servitor of Lord Ram, exhibited this wrath by burning the golden city of Ravan. But by doing so, he became the greatest devotee of the Lord. Here also in Bhagavad Gita, the Lord induces Arjuna to engage his wrath upon his enemies for the satisfaction of the Lord. Therefore, lust and wrath, when they are employed in Krishna consciousness, become our friends instead of our enemies. Srila Prabhupada begins this third paragraph talking about the inquiry and he quotes the Vedanta Sutra, Atato Brahma Jignasa. Atato meaning now, 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 why now? Because now you are a human being. So human life is meant for inquiry, to ask, who am I? Why am I here? What is matter? What is spirit? We're meant for this kind of inquiry. We're not meant to just think about where is my eating and sleeping? But we're meant to inquire about the Absolute Truth. And then Prabhupada goes on to quote the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, that the origin of everything is the Supreme Brahman. So lust is also from the Supreme Brahman. But that lust is the transformation of love. In the, originally it is love, but it has become lust. So we want to understand that lust can also be used in the service of Krishna. It's, why is it there? Because it's also used by great devotees. And Prabhupada gives the example, just like Hanuman, the great devotee of Lord Rama, he used his anger to fight against Ravan. And similarly, Arjuna, he also fought at the battle of Kurukshetra for Krishna. So he used his anger also to fight. So that is proper use of anger. But you have to be very careful. Unless one is the master of the senses, one should not try to use lust or anger or greed in the service of Krishna. We know the gopis were lusty for Krishna, but their lust is very pure. Kubja was also lusty. Her lust was not pure like the gopis. But nevertheless, she was very fortunate that she had the devotional mood. She wanted to give service to Krishna. So we have to be very careful. Don't think I can use my anger. When we get angry, 
and I'm using it in the service of Krishna. And uh, some people get angry and become angry for days. They don't calm down for days, they're so angry. Or the greed is there for a long time. And the lust also, you never satisfy the lust. People think, oh, I'm, I'm feeling lusty today, I'll, I'll have some relationship with someone and it'll help me to satisfy my lust. It will only increase the lust. It is just like scratching and, and, and if you have some irritation on the skin, maybe you're bitten by a mosquito, so the, you may scratch it, but that scratching is not going to help to cure it, rather that's going to make it worse. It's going to make the, the infection more serious. You have to be very careful. Just scratching a disease, some irritation will make it worse. You have to put some proper ointment on it to relieve the irritation. So the same way, when we become agitated, we want sense gratification, oh well I'll just have some sense gratification then I'll, I'll be okay. No, you're just going to increase the temperature. Prabhupada gives the example, many, many of you have read the Ishopanishad, how a person may have a fever. So, if you, when you have a fever, the doctor may say, don't eat this, don't eat fried food, don't take sugar, different things, restrictions on the diet. But you may think, oh no, I like these things so much, I'm not going to listen to the doctor, I'm going to take them anyway. And you take them, you increase the fever. So you increase the fever, you don't get rid of the fever. And that makes it worse. You may die. You get, as you increase the fever, you can die. We want to bring the fever down to the normal condition. Some people give the example, they said, just like doctor may come, doctor may give injection and the patient may die. And you say, oh my goodness, you'd say to the doctor, the patient's dead, you've killed him, you gave an injection. The doctor says, oh well, fever's gone. No problem, the fever's gone now, <laughs> but the patient's dead. So Mayavadi philosophy is like that. Mayavadi philosophy is like making people dead. No senses, everything negation, everything stop. It's like that, taking an, a fatal injection and you die. So we don't, want to, we don't want to make the patient dead and we don't want to increase the fever. We want to bring the fever to the normal condition. Oh, there was a little story about the fever. It happened that the, this one man, he had two ladies in his house, they both had fever. Now one was his wife and the other was the worker in the house. So they both had the fever and the man went and brought the doctor for them. And so the doctor checked him and he said, oh, your wife only has a little fever, she's not very serious, but your servant's very serious, she has a big fever. So the lady who was the wife of the man, she became very angry. What? Her fever is more than me? I am the lady of the house, I am his, I'm his wife. My fever should be more than hers. <laughs> she was saying like this, she was upset that the working lady had a bigger fever than her. So we should understand that is the disease condition, to have a big fever. You want to bring the temperature down to the normal condition. What is it, 98.5? Anyway, you want to bring the temperature down to the normal condition. You don't want to have a big fever, you don't want to make it zero. This is the process of Krishna consciousness, getting rid of the fever, coming to the normal condition. And the way to do it, by cultivating the mode of goodness through the practice of bhakti yoga, beginning with hearing and chanting. And we have to have a regular program of hearing and chanting. We should chant in the morning and we should chant again in the evening. We should have a, like a sandwich program. Morning, 
some time for chanting and hearing, and then in the evening again, some time for chanting and hearing. And during the daytime, probably you have work to do, you have duties to perform. Maybe the ladies have children to take care of, the house to clean, and so many other things to be done. But it's important to try to keep the day Krishna conscious by regularly hearing and chanting. And that way we can always remember Krishna. This is, we want to focus our activities in such a manner that whatever happens we will remember Krishna. We have to practice bringing the mind back. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna was describing about yoga, controlling the mind, and Arjuna said, I can't do it, it's very difficult. But Lord Krishna said, well, I, I know it's difficult, but it's possible by practice and by detachment. So these two things are important. We have to practice controlling the mind. The mind wanders, just like when we're chanting, our mind wanders. We have to bring it back. We have to focus the mind. Wherever the mind wanders, due to its restless and unsteady nature, we have to bring it back. And at the same time, there has to be also detachment. We have to let go of all the material things we're holding on to. And how to do that? It's made very easy for us. We simply hold on to Krishna. You don't have to give up. You don't have to change your position. You can simply stay in whatever position you're in. Lord Chaitanya never encouraged the devotees that they had to leave their home or they had to renounce or anything, but he encouraged them to hear, to spend their time in the association of devotees and hearing and chanting. He said, and this is, that is the, the program of the Paramahamsas, to hear and chant in the association of devotees. It doesn't matter what position you're in. You may be man or woman, you may be renounced, you may be retired, you may be single, not yet married, whatever position we're in. But the process is the same for everyone. We want to hear about Krishna in the association of devotees. Discussion of the topics of Krishna. In the Bhagavad Gita, in the 10th chapter, Lord Krishna has given the four nutshell verses which summarize the main teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. And the one verse, first verse is on Sambandha Gyan, knowledge of the relationship. And then the second verse is dealing with the process. So the process is called Abhidaya, Abhidaya Gyan, the process of devotional service which will lead to the goal. So he describes the process, Machita Madgata Prana Bodhayantas Parasparam Katayantas Chamam Nityam Tushyanti Cha Ramante Cha the thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me, their lives are surrendered unto me, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss by enlightening one another and conversing about me. So this is the business of devotees. We want to practice these activities fix our minds on Krishna, surrender ourselves to Krishna, and discuss topics of Krishna with devotees. It's very good to read, but it's even better when you're discussing with the devotees. So we always like to get a group of devotees together to hear and chant and to discuss. So I'm very glad I had the opportunity tonight to speak to all the devotees there in Klang. So, I want to know, are there any questions there from anyone?
Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. We are so grateful for Guru Maharaj's class. I hope there are questions from the participants. Of course, in this section, Lord Krishna goes on to give a detailed analysis of where the lust is found. He said, lust is found in the senses and in the mind and in the intelligence. And then he also explains how we can overcome this lust. And he talks about, uh, because the, the lust is described, all devouring sinful enemy. And then he talks, lust covers the real knowledge of the living entity, bewilders him. Therefore, in, you will see text 41, Lord Krishna says, in the very beginning, curb this great symbol of sin lust by regulating the senses and slay this destroyer of knowledge and self-realization. So regulating the senses is very much recommended. If Just like sometimes people may eat more, they should be regulated in their eating. You want to be, don't want to be eating all times of the day and night. There should be regulation, proper times to eat. And there should be regulated amounts also. And similarly with sleeping. You don't want to sleep more, you don't want to sleep less. It should be regulated. So these things help us to get rid of the lust. Help us to purify our heart. And uh, then there's another verse. Uh, in text 43, Lord Krishna says, O mighty armed Arjuna, steady the mind by deliberate spiritual intelligence, and thus by spiritual strength conquer this insatiable enemy known as lust. So Lord Krishna has given us a very powerful solution here. He said, deliberate spiritual intelligence. We have to steady the mind by deliberate spiritual intelligence. How do we get that spiritual intelligence? Well, Prabhupada has put, after spiritual intelligence, he's put Krishna consciousness. So by the process of Krishna consciousness, we cultivate our spiritual intelligence. So particularly important, hearing and chanting. And then, by spiritual strength, conquer this insatiable enemy known as lust. So we have to develop that spiritual strength that we can say no. We can say, no, I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get greedy. I'm not going to become lusty. I'm going to control my mind and senses. It's a very important training for all of us. We have to go through this training. We were never, we, were, we, were, we got education. We got some kind of education, material education. But we never got this spiritual education. We didn't get the opportunity to cultivate spiritual strength to actually conquer over things like lust and anger and greed. So it, it's a very powerful philosophy and you can see it, it's very, very practical. So we have to also develop the spiritual intelligence and by spiritual strength then we can conquer this insatiable enemy. Insatiable means never satisfied. Just gratifying the senses, it's not going to stop. It's not going to end. The more you have sense gratification, the more we want it. We have to be very cautious. Just like you may eat one rasgulla, you know rasgulla or gulabjaman, you eat one gulabjaman, and then you, oh, that was really good. I want another one. I think I have another one. And you have another one. And then you go on and you eat 
15, 20 Gulab Jamin soon. Are you going to be satisfied? It's the nature of the tongue. Never satisfied. The more we eat, the more we want to eat. So we have to be very careful to guard against these fall downs by taking shelter of Lord Krishna. There is a question, Guru Maharaj. Oh, yeah? Yeah, from Her Grace Rukmini Dwarakadish Didi. Oh, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble audience. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I have a question that, you know, I understand that I cannot be perfect, but this Krishna consciousness will make me perfect. This path is make, make me perfect. But at times, you know, Maharaj, Guru Maharaj, my mind, you know, sometimes I'm feeling very active and enthusiastic. You know, I, you know my mind is on the right uh, thought, you know, I have to chant attentively and all that. But why is it that after some time I'm feeling, you know, my mind keeps telling me, oh, I'm feeling lazy, uh, let's do it slowly. You know, I, I'm feeling that, you know, one day I feel active and then after some time, or oh, maybe after a few days I'm feeling tired. Or maybe I'm feeling, I, I don't feel that enthusiasm, you know, Maharaj. And then also, you know, even when I'm doing my Aarti and all that, uh, sometimes I'm, you know, my mind is fixed completely on the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. But at, at the same time, you know, after some time, you know, my mind is like somewhere loitering around somewhere. But why is it like that, that, you know, so, you know, like the one day I'm feeling active and then the other day I'm feeling kind of lazy. I have to be honest with you. So why is it like this? Is there anything? I mean, is there is there anything wrong with the practice that I'm doing? Well, you have to understand that it's practice. You have to keep practicing. It's going to take time. You know, I, I how long have you been practicing? And you have to also understand the nature of the mind. That it's very, the nature of the mind is like that. That sometimes it's good, you know, sometimes it's very enthusiastic, and other times it's not enthusiastic at all. We have to understand that's just the mind. The mind can be the friend. The mind can be the enemy. So some days the mind is the, your friend, and some days your mind is your enemy. You have to understand when is the mind being a friend and when is it being an enemy. And you have to go on regardless. Therefore, it was mentioned here about being very regulated. The regulation is important. You have to know that this is your regulated program. You do RT at this time. There's no question of thinking, oh, I'm not enthusiastic, I'm not going to do it. I don't feel so enthusiastic today, therefore I won't do it. No, we have to do it. It's our duty. So that regulation. Then, and then here also, text number 43, Lord Krishna speaks about spiritual intelligence, that we can steady the mind by deliberate spiritual intelligence. We have to understand this how, how do we get the spiritual intelligence? By hearing from the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, we cultivate the spiritual knowledge and we learn about the nature of the mind, how the mind is flickering and unsteady, restless, more trouble to control it than the wind, and even Arjuna couldn't control his mind. And so what to speak of us? We're nothing compared to Arjuna, and Arjuna can't control his mind, so what hope do we have? But Lord Krishna was encouraging, he told Arjuna that you can do it. I know it's difficult, but you can do it by practice. We have to practice more and more, take some time. Just like you know yourself, you practiced. You practice singing, you practice playing the piano and so on, you practice speaking Tamil and so on. You know, the many things you practice. And if we practice nicely, gradually, we will master, we will learn to do it properly. So we have to keep endeavoring, we have to keep practicing, 
don't give up, be determined. Then Lord Krishna mentions it here about uh, stand and fight. <laughs> uh, steady the mind and, and by spiritual strength conquer the insatiable enemy. So the, the, your mind is that insatiable enemy. You have to conquer that tendency there within your mind. And some days it's not supporting you. It's your enemy. You have to be determined. I'm not going to listen to the mind. You know, the mind will say, oh, yeah, you chanted yesterday. You should have a day off today. Oh, yeah, you got up early the, yesterday. Don't get up so early today. You need more rest. It will be good for you. The mind will say, oh, you didn't eat enough yesterday. You should eat more today. You should have a, you know. Don't, don't go without your food. Eat a good meal. Be full. The mind will always tell us to do more or sometimes it's telling us to do less. Telling us to do whatever we don't want to do. We're trying to do something. The mind wants to do something else. We want to chant and the mind says, Oh no, don't chant. Oh no, no. no. We're not going to do that again. The mind will say like that. You have to understand that's the nature of the mind. But I'm not going to listen to the mind. I'm going to conquer the mind. So this is, this is the spiritual intelligence which comes with Krishna consciousness. The more we're Krishna conscious, the more we will conquer the mind. We won't be influenced by the mind. Do you understand Rukmini Dwarkadish, Maharaji? Yes, 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 Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. And I also have um, one one more question, Guru Maharaj. Um, I I have I've been hearing that donating our our eyes after our, you know when when my when my body uh, when the soul leaves the body, people like to donate their eyes and their I don't know their organs. What do you think about that, Guru Maharaj? Well, if you don't donate them for a devotee, it's all right. Okay, I understand, Guru Maharaj. Just, just like we know His Holiness Jai Pataka Swami Maharaj, he had organ transplant, so it's very, it was helpful for him. You know, someone left the body and uh, his organs were transplanted into Jai Pataka Swami's body, so it made life a bit easier for Jai Pataka Swami Maharaj having the different organs because his own organs were in very bad condition. So if you give the organs or the eyes for a devotee, it's good. But if you give them for somebody, for some material active, activity, it's not good, right? If they take your organs and use them for their materialistic life, for their sense gratification and their sinful activities, it's not very good. Okay, thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. All right. Yes. There is another question from Yuna Mataji. Oh, yeah. Uh, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances, O Guru Shushila Prabhupada. Uh, my question is, uh, of course, uh, cities are in uh, the Rajaguna, and uh, it is better to live in countryside. But if we will not uh, live in, in uh, cities, how can we understand other people who live in cities? Uh, who live in cities? And uh, how can we understand their um, everyday life, their problems? And uh, Prabhupada said uh, that uh, we have to live in countryside. But uh, maybe is it contradiction or not? Well, if you're going to live in the city, you still have to be Krishna conscious. That is the point. You may live in the city, but you have to keep a Krishna conscious lifestyle and not be caught up. Just like Prabhupada went to New York, but he said, I'm always in Vrindavan. He didn't say, I'm in New York and now I'm in New York, I have to be like a New Yorker. Prabhupada said, I'm always in Vrindavan. 
So Krishna conscious lifestyle doesn't change. You're in the city or in the countryside, same thing. People think because they're in the city, they sleep late and they get up late, you know, and they go out and eat outside and eat all garbage and go make so many things. But Krishna conscious devotee doesn't do like that. Even the devotees in the city, he will wake up early in the morning, and go to Mongolati, chant his rounds in the morning. So we have to be transcendental, right? We don't just, we don't think that we're living in the city. That's an illusion. So, we see devotees in the morning, devotees are going to Mongolati, and people are all coming home from the club. They're coming home from the bars and from the clubs and, you know, their life is different. So a devotee's life is different from the materialist. So a devotee it just has to be careful that you live in the city, don't be affected by the city. Remember, you're still a devotee and your duty is to serve Krishna. Right? We have to we have to regulate ourselves and we keep the same regulation. It doesn't matter whether you're in the countryside or in the city. The regulation should be the same wherever you go. You know, we don't say, oh, we're in the city, so Mongol Arti is later today. No. We have Mongol at the same time in the city as in the countryside. In Vrindavan and Mayapur, we have Mongol at 4.30 in the morning. And in, in, in Kalkara city, they have Mongol Arti at 4.30 in the morning. And in Mumbai, they have the same time, 4.30. Of course, in Malaysia, it's later because the sun rises later. So, the different, different countries, depending on what time the sun rises. But it should be before the sun rises. It should be in the the Brahma Mahurta. Brahma Mahurta means before, one and a half hours before sunrise. That's auspicious time for spiritual practice. And you will see the, the people of other religious traditions, they also do like that. The Muslims, they have early morning prayer. And the Buddhists also, they wake up early in the morning and do their meditation. And even the Christians, there are Christian monks, they also have an early morning Mass. Uh, Guru Maharaj, and one little question. Uh, but we, in December, we will have a sunrise about 10 o'clock in the morning, and Brahma Mukhurta will be very late. Yes, uh, I know. At what time? Yes. Yes. Yes, I know. <laughs> Well, that's special circumstances there, where you're living, because it's that region. So you have sunrise later. In China also there's places like that. So what to do? You, but still you should try to keep your regulation, waking up early in the morning and waiting for the sunrise. And you don't have to be controlled by the sunrise. It's, it's up there in the summertime, the sun sets very late, right? We have, the, in Finland, they have the land of the midnight sun. So the sun sets at midnight in the summer. In the winter, there's no sun. <laughs> so what to do? You have to be, a re there has to be regulation. That's the main point. You have to be regulated. You should want to wake up early in the morning. And depending what time you have to begin work, you know, you have to get up before you go to, before your working time, so that you have time to do chanting and, and you do some prayer to Krishna, offer prayers to Krishna before you do your work. So Prabhupada liked devotees to get up by four o'clock in the morning. About four o'clock in the morning we'd all wake up. That's, Prabhupada would recommend that. He would say, try to get up before four in the morning. And of course that means you would sleep earlier also. You should sleep by 10 o'clock in the evening. Then you have six hours rest, right? 
So you sleep at 10 o'clock, you get up at 4 o'clock, 6 hours sleep. That's a good night's rest, 6 hours. You may need more, you may need less. It's different for different people, but that's average, about 6 hours. You shouldn't need much more. Okay? Thank you, thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Guru Maharaj, do you have time to take another question? Okay. Do you have time, Guru Maharaj? Okay, yeah, I'll try. Okay, there's another question by Sudha Sindhu Mataji. Mataji, make your question a bit short, Mataji. Guru Maharaj has another class in 15 minutes time. Mm, okay, uh, I just, a very quick question. I want to know about this uh, uh, gay and lesbian people. Uh, is it because uh, due to their past time or is it influenced by by certain culture from the Western to Asia, gay and lesbian? Is it mentioned in our Vedic scripture regarding them, how they become gay or lesbian? Is it something natural or influenced or because of past karma? Uh, there is some mention about men being attracted to other men, gay men. It's mentioned there that in the beginning of creation, men became lusty after other men, some men. But this is, of course, this is the mode of ignorance. This is not normal behavior. This is the mode of ignorance. So, is it karma? Yes, there's karma there. And it's also due to the environment. Some situations are, they make it you know, different different environments that make it easier for people to become like that. But of course their karma is there. That is their karma. Their karma is towards sinful activities. Mis their, their sinful activity. They want sense gratification. They want sense gratification and they don't want to take responsibility. Actually, people who are like that, they need to be married, they should be married. They should be married, properly married, and they should have a wife, and then they can properly satisfy their material desires in a religious manner. But that trans this uh, gay behavior, this is just people who want to avoid, since they want to avoid responsibility. They don't want to take any responsibility. They just want to have sense gratification in the most perverted manner. So it's, it's very sinful. Okay, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. We'd like to offer our deep appreciation to Guru Maharaj for a wonderful, amazing class and so much uh, enlightenment for our spiritual advancement. Thank you again, Guru Maharaj. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. My humble obeisances to everyone. Srila Prabhupada ki. Hi. Hi. Gorbhakta Vrinda ki.